Okay, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, my name is Karina Reynolds, I'm the Executive Director and I am also a um, organizing member of the college or the um, uh, uh, Contemporary Artist Book Conference. With me is James Mitchell, who will be helping out with a little bit of the tech. Um, so if anyone has an issue since 2008, and this year was organized by Center for Book Arts as part of the Printed Matter Virtual Art Book Fair. We'd like to thank the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts for their generous support of Center for Book Arts Criticism Initiative and in making the conference possible. Additional thanks to our conference sponsors, the Brooklyn Rail, Sorted Library, and Small Editions. Center for Book Arts and the usual in-person space of the Contemporary Artist Book Conference are on the unceded land of the Munsi Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging and uplifting the Munsi Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations, and the lands in which you are tuning in from. There are 10 sessions overall between Friday and Sunday, exploring a wide range of questions about artist book criticism, what, is, what it is now and what it can be in the future. Um, these sessions also include uh, two convening sessions. One of them happened last night and another will be taking place this evening, as well as a closing plenary in which we will look to collect actionable ideas and recommendations that arise throughout the conference. These items will be posted on the CBA website with progress reported during the coming year and at next year's edition of the conference. In addition to the Zoom meetings, sessions are being live streamed to the uh, Printed Matter Virtual Art Book Fair page um, for the CABC and recorded. After the conference, these videos will be posted to the Center for Book Arts website um, where you'll be able to view them at your leisure and on demand. If you have questions during the session, please post them in the chat. And as hosts, we'll be asking them on your behalf to the participants and the presenters. Attendees will be muted throughout the duration of the program. And we will um, recommend that you also keep your cameras turned off. Please feel free to use the chat during the session and to communicate with other audience members as well as us, the hosts and the presenters. And remember to remain respectful of the speakers and other attendees. We'll also be posting relevant links during the talks. If you have any um, need for assistance, as I mentioned earlier, please send a private message to anyone with CABC in their name. I'd now like to introduce the moderator of this session, Maddie Rosenberg. Um, Maddie Rosenberg is a native of Brooklyn. Uh, she maintains an active international curatorial and exhibition career with an approach to curating as an extension of her art practice. Um, Maddie Rosenberg is also the founder of Central Booking, which many of you will have heard of, uh, a multidisciplinary art space focusing on artist books and art and science exhibitions collaborative partnerships and environmental and social justice programming is an essential component of her practice. Over the years, Rosenberg has written a number of catalog essays, reviews, and curatorial statements. Her extensive bibliography um, can be found at almost every uh, artist book review site um, to date. So um, please join me in welcoming Maddie Rosenberg. Thanks, Karina, and to all behind the scenes and everyone else here. Um, I'm joined today by three artists, Mary Ting, Miriam Scher, and Pablo Helguera, who also write criticism among uh, other liter literary pursuits, coming from their own specific points of view on the artist book. Then we will be joined by a non-art practitioner, a critic, John Haber, who has reviewed art for several decades now. As both the multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary field, there are numerous ways to approach the artist book, which is why I find as a curator, as well as an artist, it is one of the more dynamic places happening in art today. Often when we speak of the book, 
It conjures up an idea of a container for literature, maybe with some illustrations or designs for the text in what's become a conventional structure, a bound codex. Some discuss artwork as being in book form. Books are referred to as publication and those that produce them as publishers. But for many, we come to artist books from a very different perspective. We are artists and as such can work within limitations, but are also eager to push beyond the predictable. And with the book, we can be expansive. The codex becomes just one form among many and is used for specific reasons of content for a particular work, not as a default. The artist book is where text, when there is any, is interwoven with image, becomes image, and the image is thereby not subservient to the text. It's not there to illustrate the text. It is just, it isn't just what you say, it's how you say it. A visual language is intrinsic to conveying content. For many of us, it can be any object, any surface, any material. It can be an intimate handheld piece, panels on a wall, or an installation of multiple elements. make the book as the way I could add time and space into a flat print. Among my first exposure to communication through the visual was Egyptian temples. Now you may ask as a person from Brooklyn, how is this my first exposure? But I uh, spent much time in the Brooklyn Museum among the fragments where text was image for me and images were incised into the forms of a stone sculpt structure. I could not read the text, so I could only see it visually. The first research paper I actually wrote uh, when I was 12 was on Egyptian art. It was heavy on photos. My grandfather was a self-taught Jewish scholar, and so among the first books I saw were religious scrolls. Jado was for those who couldn't read the Bible. The scenes were brought together in multi panels where the correct sequence was, of course, essential to create the narrative. In Book of Days, a painting, the six panels are is very important that each day was a separate panel, even though the sequence forms an ordinary closed square when it's hung. The eye follows its way around the square, movement from panel to panel, assisted by the flat planes of color. With Joseph Cornell, we have an assemblage wall box, a grid gouged out and embedded within the structure of an ordinary book, and the manual of marbles, with shapes deliberately cut through the pages, tipped in elements, and collaged images disrupting the text of the Journal de Agriculture Pratique. In pieces of eight, we have eight small painted panels that are installed winding around wall corners in this very specific sequence. With Salzburg Portfolio, an artist book that was meant to go with the painted piece, uh, there, it is an unbound book of six um, three color lithographs that were done in conjunction with this painting and also meant to be seen in this specific order. Piranesi's imaginary prisons, here are two. It's a series of etchings that um, was very inspirational to me as well. I was first drawn to printmaking through the black and white image, which creating space and objects through value. This book, Reptiles, the black and white create a Gothic feeling, though the imagery was drawn from later sources. Lithography, initially used for inexpensive reproduction, became a process in itself for artists to work with. Each page is cut through to become a framing device for the stone creatures at each end. 
Oops. Okay. This is Shadow of Descent, a collaboration with Austrian artist Hubert Sommerauer, where the 3D world pops up and then folds down again into its box. It's a recurring theme and a big interest of mine is to take the 2D into 3D and then back into collapsing it back into uh, near 2D again. Berlin Bestiary takes the Jewish cemetery in Weissensee, Berlin, as the setting in this two-sided bestiary of animal sculptures that have been photographed around Berlin. The mausoleums become the cages for the sculptures. And this is an image from one of the images of one of the pages from the Berlin Bestiary on a single page. I created um, a blown up uh, individual um, elements from that piece into a library case, thereby reinventing the original book art form. Oh, we get to central booking, and here we have Heidi Nielsen putting on, uh, helping to put on um, the our name on our very first space in Dumbo. We opened in Dumbo, Brooklyn, in two thousand nine. I founded this as a space where book art could be seen in all its variety and integrated into contemporary art gallery exhibitions. We put on four art and science theme exhibitions a year where the book art was one element of all different other forms of uh, and media in art. I work with hundreds of artists internationally. And even though we no longer have a space, we gave it uh, our own space up two years ago, we still work and collaborate with other spaces nationally and internationally, as well as our home base in New York. This was our first show, uh, Natural Histories. You can see the office area there, and then there's the view from the office area into the exhibition. And you can see very much that this space itself becomes an environment. And I use all aspects when I'm designing the space of installation, wall work, and work that even floats from the ceiling. In the anthropology exhibition, we have the work of Janet Goldner, who spends much of her year in Mali and makes metal sculptures. Many of them are books, artist books, and they are from the very small that she can hold in her hand to the very large, such as this one, which we could walk through. You walk through at your own pace, take your own time, and to look at all three pages of the books. She uses a blowtorch to sear the pages of symbolic Molly shapes with the English text. This was an exhibition of book art that I did in Phoenix, Brighton uh, for Central Booking um, in the UK. On, this was the first time I actually worked with another gallery designer. Um, that was the collaboration in this project, which was very interesting for me. It was Curious Space. They took the structure of one of the books in the exhibition and created the whole exhibition design from that structure. On the left side, you can see a close up of the work of um, um, Martin and Eric Domain. And um, these are uh, hand folded scores uh, that are meant to be played. That's what the straws are there for. So it's a very interactive piece as well. And Eric is a mathematician at MIT and paper folding is his field. Um, on the right, you can see there is a library made out of the work of Liberator, a Polish couple. He is a, um, Zenon is a, um, Pfeiffer is the Polish performative poet. Um, this is their imprint and the library was made from their published work with videos of some of the work that they performed in our screening room. Loss was made for the Al Mutanabi project. For this book, it was important for it to be codex, obviously, and bound. I researched images from illuminated manuscripts of Baghdad, Photoshop pieces of them together, 
and incorporated photos of bomb buildings in each page, eviscerating any text from being readable for those who could actually read the text. The book sequences from right to left as well as left to right, uh, because there is no right way to, see, to read it. It can be read both ways. And then the edges were burnt. City stamp book, again, it's important for this to be bound and um, because it is trying to emulate uh, a book of stamps. Now we're in the um, lo uh, Lower East Side space of central booking. This is, we were there for five years. We had luxurious space there. And in fact, there were three exhibition spaces. This was Plant Cure, um, an uh, exhibition that we did in collaboration with the uh, Academy, the New York Academy of Medicine, where I sent five artists to research their work in the Rare Books Library over six months. And they made their work for the exhibition. They were then joined with 10 other artists working in the theme uh, to create the exhibition. Uh, two of the artists in residence are viewed here. On the left is Susan Rostow's sculptural books uh, and made from prints. And on the, um, in behind her on the right, you can see an installation by Mary Ting who will speak about her work soon. In one of the rooms, to the side, you can see there is there was a constant panorama of the library going. This we get to Plant Cure, which is meant to be a traveling project where we where we have uh, different artists that are place where there is a uh, significant amount of work on on the um, for artists to research on the. <coughs> topic of um, medicinal plants. Um, this was the latest uh, iteration of it, which was in, uh, opened um, a year ago. Um, and it was on March 3rd, 2020 at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. It has been in hibernation since. We are hoping people can see it again in person very soon. You can see this uh, installation of Desiree Alvarez, in which she uh, has printed, painted, and drawn on, um, on cloth to create an installation, a book installation. She considers each one of the fabrics a page. She's also a poet, so the text in it is, written text is actually her own as well. Uh, and you can, there's a uh, book of hers as well that is in the case. So, uh, which is a hand, can be a handheld uh, accordion book. Next to her is a book by Amanda Thackeray. And behind her is her installation piece, which is uh, based on a grid of a um, trellis. And then we wind up with, the COVID project. Um, this is on the waterfront. It's a four page pop-up. You can see each one of the four pages pops up into a different setting of the Brooklyn waterfront on um, a uh, historical map um, of Brooklyn. And uh, each one of those pages fold down and then can be stored in the found box on the left. This was for a project that uh, is continuous and is, in, is a collaboration that we're doing with the New York Historical Society. And again, someday it uh, will be seen in person. Now on to Mary Ting. Mary Ting uses, hi Mary, <laughs> uses visual art, writing, research and lectures as a means to reflect and comment on cultural history, trauma, and the loss of nature. Ting's recent re retrospective, Our Hive is Sick, at University of Massachusetts Amherst, featured 30 years of sculpture, installations, books, drawings, prints, and community projects. Recent press include an interview with editor Amy Brady of Artists and Climate Change, 
a Carlo Chapal feature um, and the Truth Out article on COVID era artists. Prior solo exhib exhibitions include Lambden Foundation, Dean Project, Metaphor Contemporary Art, and Kentler Drawing Space. Ting has received grants from the New York Foundation for the Arts, Gottlieb Foundation, Paula Krasner Foundation, and residencies at the Joan Mitchell Center, NOLA. Du Dene, Lower East Side Print Shop, LMCC Governor's Island, Malay Colony, and the McDonald Colony, among many others. She presently teaches in both the art department and the environmental justice program at John Jay College in New York City. Thank you so much, Maddie. And thank you, Corinne, for Center for Book Arts. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I'm just gonna go straight to my slideshow. So I'm gonna be talking about um, Chinese traditional books and the language of books um, and its relationship to social, political, contemporary art. So um, I think many people are aware of this, but a quick run through. So in the history of the book, um, especially from a Chinese perspective, we look at oracle bones, um, the writings on turtle shells, which is like the earliest format that I would call of a book. Um, and then wooden slats, um, bamboo scripts, palm leaves, uh, the invention of silk, you can have silk scrolls, the invention of paper, then onto paper, also movable type, albums, paper size sticks, accordion folds. Um, and then thinking of the book, as Maddie said, as a container, a holder of information. Um, originally, you were finding it as the container for documents, deeds, correspondence in the earliest forms. Um, and then with printed books, you've got the dissemination of information, the spread of religion. The Buddhist Dhamma Sutra, which is pictured here, is the oldest printed book in existence. <coughs> we're talking about um, 868. And then... Um, books as containers for news, um, map making, really political constructs to view the world, geopolitical constructs. Um, of course, there's literature, arts, culture, sciences, um, education, archives, national identity, propaganda. I mean, the list is on and on in the relationship of books to other things or how you could view what could be a book or the language of books. So in China, that also comes as with many other places um, that comes with the history of book banning, as well as scholars being imprisoned for their writings. Um, and so books are coming out of once again, that historical geopolitical social construct. And in that language of the books, you've got so many offshoots and then thinking about sequence, whether it's the, the folds in a folded fan, um, or banners that are strung across a doorway, folded screens, the libraries, and also just language itself, right? Um, language heard, spoken, hidden language, secret languages, visual languages. Um, so I'm gonna restrict it just to talking about um, Chinese traditional books and Chinese contemporary art. So with China, we've got the particulars of this 5,000 years of continuous civilization. And I would say that for most Chinese and Chinese artists in particular, that is a pretty complicated relationship, that relationship with history. Um, and even for myself as an American born Chinese, that is again, incredibly complicated. Uh, on the one hand, it's that awe of that huge amounts of time uh, of such an old civilization. On, on the other hand, it's overbearing. It's a burden for so many, right? Because you are a tiny little peon in this vast 5,000 years. And also that notion of the, the scholar class and that it's not until you're really an elderly person, maybe 70 or 80, that your calligraphy or what you draw or write or paint is like worthy. Um, so there's that, that burden aspect of it. And of course, there is that, and so then you have that relation of the past bearing onto your present and future. 
Um, and of course, it is your historical memory, the role of books within propaganda, national memory, the way it's taught in schools, right? And the documentation of the winner, um, what's left out about the quote unquote, the victim and the archive. So I'm um, gonna give you some examples. Uh, so here we have a very early format before paper was invented and it's a wooden board and you can see it's got this piece that comes out and once you open it, it's bound with a piece of cord and sealed with a wax seal. And then once you slide it open, you've got inside, this is used for um, contracts and deeds, uh, land ownership, right? Um, so it's really official documents. And then it was sent with a messenger to the bearer, right? To the recipient. Um, so this is my um, take on it. And so it, it's titled, I Can Count No More. And it's from 1985. And now thinking back on this, this is like a, uh, an 80s Me Too. Um, so inside this text, so taking on, totally changing this notion of ownership and embracing the notion of this, this is it, this is, this, completely not tolerable anymore. And inside is the text of, of the thoughts as a rape is going on. Um, and then if you read the text, it's, it's talking about, you. there's also this kind of, um, you know, with, with the rapist where it's talking about, you know, Guang Gong will get you. So, um, you know, if you try and fight. So, and I have a whole series of these taking this format um, and taking re-ownership of this whole concept. Um, so this is another thing where the earlier formats before paper, you would have bamboo scripts, um, other cultures might have um, leaves instead, palm leaves, uh, depending on what's available. And again, it's a cord to bind them together. Um, and in this case, again, it's more official documents. Um, and this is the recording of the number of weapons. Right? So these are all um, numerical things like 200 of this and 300 of that. Um, and these are very early works. And so in my piece, and this is just a detail of it, um, it's about 48 inches long. It's taking up the daily and also the, the of women, right? So it's the tears, the cuts, the burn holes, the knots um, of the daily life in contrast. Um, and here are some more. Um, using that kind of sutra or lotus leaf format. Um, and so this is called counting and it's about, um, again, the daily and it's about the, um, the process of going through disease, right? And sickness. And these are all handmade paper sheets. They were made at Dudenay and there's text on it. Um, and it could be hung and displayed in different ways. This is a cord that's also trying to be akin to like an intestinal type of form. Again, thinking upon, upon those leaves. Um, so this is body ravaged. Again, it's handmade paper that's been waxed um, with text on it uh, and then holding it together. Um, I guess this is like a codex um, are these fishing hooks really to, and it, if it's pulled taut um, like stretching the skin. And so this handmade paper, um, and the same thing with the prior work as well, the wax was put on it also to give the feel of a translucency and make it closer to a skin like finish, right? So the wax is actually melted into it. Uh, again, this is using the same technique of the handmade paper and um, soot and cut paper and the wax is pushed in, it's melted into it. Um, and it's a ghost story. Again, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the nineties in rural areas, Northern, very, very remote areas in China, um, in cave dwelling areas along the Yellow River Plateau. Um, and so much of this, the poignant, poignant untold stories of the rural poor um, where folk art is still quite prevalent in those areas back in the 90s. Um, and, you know, superstition and ghosts and really the, the hardships of these areas, which at that time really um, everyone who was more of age that could 
flee those areas from now in the cities, and it's really was the elderly and the very, very young. Also, you know, the notion of language, um, there's something called Nu Shu, which is a script that was only used by women. Um, and this at that time period is a lot of women that were not, you know, it's really only the elite women at one point that could, there was only one college um, at one point in college that, is, that accepted, in China that accepted women, that was the Jinling College. Um, and, you know, for so many, especially rural poor women, they were not taught how to read or write. And in Hunan province, it was found that women had invented their own script. And this was just completely among themselves and they wrote on fans and all, all different assorted um, uh, uh, materials. And it was really what was happening to them. It was among themselves, it was shared, it was a sisterhood. In some cases, it could be complaints, right? This is an outlet. In some places, it was just about their day. Um, so it's an assortment. Oh, I should also say that the last woman original writer uh, passed away, but there was all these efforts to try and document it. Um, and so taking upon that concept of lost languages and things that don't get to be expressed in the formal official language, I have a series of these like manuscripts. Um, and this is called the biblical chord manuscript and it's taking up that, that fragmented ancient textile um, as book. This is a detail of what's an ongoing piece. It's a reassembly manuscript and it's made of wax and, and you know, on tarlatan and it's all kind of falling apart and it's, it's the attempt to re-stick it all together again. Um, and this is ongoing, so it'll be quite long. So um, with the advent of the, of the invention of paper so you have these albums and they're side stitched. Um, this is a very famous work. I, I grew up with this. This is my mom's copy of the Mustard Seed Garden Manual, which is a painting manual, but in many ways it's so much more. It's a how to draw. It also gives you some basic uh, botanical and zoological information about plant structure, about animals, um, and also how to draw. Um, and how to paint flowers, birds, rocks, you know, the canyon of Chinese painting, basically. And so this, I'm taking that structure, you, I don't know if you can see it, it's pretty light in there. Um, but uh, the structure of that book page, and, you know, in contrast to this, all this beautiful nature is the reality of what we're dealing with um, today with the story of the sick hive. And these are hives that have, you know, so much um, neonicotinoids and spray of pesticides and that these hives are all sick. And you can see the once very formalized grid pattern is all irregular, right? Um, and then this is also another famous work, uh, the Shanghai Jin, which is an ancient bestiary. Um, some people think of it as like an early geography book, other people think of it as a more of a shamanistic volume, um, but they're talking about places far away. Oh, this has been reversed. It almost looks like a shooping. <laughs> um, so anyway, so this is these mythical, right? They're talking about, oh, in the far west, these creatures exist or these people exist. Um, and it's so it's like the five-tailed fox and the nine-headed bird. And so this is my play on that um, notion of the Shanghai Jing and these mystical. And again, it's in the uh, contemporary end of things where it's a creature coming out of a blood spill or it could be an oil spill. Um, and I have a whole bunch of these uh, creatures and I'm thinking of what I'd like to do is to animate them. And I, I think of animation is really coming out of book arts and books also as well in the sequence. So also um, a connection to books is scrolls, right? And, and paintings that are mounted on scrolls. So this is my uh, work. And so these are my mom's paintings. Um, and I also grew up with these ivory objects. Um, and it's the irony of what has happened in that, you know, these Buddhist deities in their ivory formats, and this is, you know, throughout the ages, ivory uh, was considered this cultural, um, 
this object of the well cultured, the scholarly class. And it's great irony and tragedy that these Buddhist icons, especially Guanyin, the goddess of mercy and compassion, is carved out of ivory, which can only be gotten um, by hacking out the face of an elephant. Um, so in the text, as with the tradition of Chinese painting, that you've got this text and it's really considered one completely together. It's a holistic approach that the, the writing and the artwork, um, the painting go together. So it's a, it's a saying that, you know, moms would say to their children that, you know, when you have mercy and compassion in your heart, that your life is so much fuller. So that was chosen for its irony. Um, and this is something that many people completely are oblivious about that ivory comes out of, you know, a poached, a dead elephant, right? And in this one, this is uh, the laughing Buddha, the smiling Buddha who traditionally he's smiling out of the generosity uh, of others, right? It's the giving. Um, and in you know modern times, he's often equated with he's surrounded by coins um, and gold, and people have all these notions about you know you rub his tummy and then that way you can get good luck. Um, so the what I have up here is and it's kind of a double, uh, it's like an ironic thing. So it says you know the laughing Buddha. So it's whether he is <clears throat> laughing at this carcass of this elephant herd. Um, or if he's laughing at people for thinking this way. Um, and I'm also including this, which was exhibited at Central Booking. Um, and it's my due, it's uh, evidence of a questionable life. And it's a mock witch trial of taking all these different, um, sorry, items from my personal archive and family archive, um, as well as sculptures and items as if putting the family on a mock witch trial um, because my in, within my family we had five members that was purged during the cultural revolution because um, I come from a family of scientists. Uh, my grand uncle was the uh, founder of the uh, National Academy of Sciences and the physics department at Beijing University, Fudan University. So we have all these different artifacts um, and the flip-flop of history. At one point you're considered this you know, national hero, so to speak. Um, and then in another point, you're considered like an enemy, a traitor, um, and your body is tossed. And then here we have, this is um, on the web where you have, it's the only place where you can actually tell the truth. It's actually these, it's called Wa Heaven, W-A dot Heaven. And this is where people can have these virtual memorials for people. And you could say things anonymously and um, talk about how they really died. Um, people have been erased out of history or it's been changed what actually happened. Um, and then some contemporary artists, uh, Lu Shengzhong, who is known for his cut paper work. And here he is, he's taking this image and this is actually coming out of folk culture. And it's this image of a person and it's really actually of a little girl and you can see she's got ponytails, pigtails. Um, and it's actually also a fertility symbol, a life symbol, and also somewhat resembles a frog. Um, and so they're called like a wah wah, it's a little girl. Um, so she's ta he's taking it and repeating it, right? And then you see the positive negative here as well. And it's called a book um, from humanity. And this is just one page. And then here he is taking that paper cut. And then this is all the little pieces that fall out so it's the negative space and then laying it out um, as language on a tombstone. And then here it is, uh, he's also taking that same notion but magnifying it as an installation. Um, and probably many of you are familiar with Xu Bing and the book from the sky. Um, so with this work, I think it covers so many issues, in, in particular, the notion of language and how for Xu Bing's generation, which is the Cultural Revolution generation, um, they have a really kind of, you know, uncomfortable relationship with books because so much was censored. Basically, the only book that in his growing up that he could read was, you know, Mao's Red Book. 
um, and you know everything that was old tradition, old custom, bourgeois, you know, the four olds was banned, especially Western literature that was completely forbidden. Um, so then when he was later on able to, you know, after the end of the central of uh, the Cultural Revolution, and then you have all these books, um, and he was in the US and he talks about how, you know, he was in a library and all these books he couldn't read because he couldn't read English. Um, but this isn't actually an earlier work uh, and he is making up he came from a printmaking background and he's made up. So it's following the constructs of Chinese writing, um, which has a very specific stroke order, um, but none of this is legible. None of it is meaning, it doesn't mean anything. And if someone who reads Chinese, if you look at this, I mean, I look at this and I feel incredibly uncomfortable. To me, it's like taking my body and like making me go into awkward positions like twisting your arms and things, because it's incredibly discordant, dissident, um, incongruent to look at because it's close, but not at all, right? Um, and then here you have all these, the wood blocks, and then it's, it was a humongous uh, feat to carve all the wood blocks and then do this incredible printing. So, um, so just to sort of wrap it up, it's this notion of books coming out of this historical, geopolitical, social, social cultural construct, the institutional as well as the individual narratives, the lived experiences. And yet the artwork that is related to books, unfortunately, all too often get relegated to this sub niche of crafts, right? or this in-between novel genre, where because people can't put it into painting or not quite sculpture. Um, and then the emphasis is on its binding structure and its cover, what I would call dressings, right? Um, and so I'm proposing that given the weight, the complexity and the interdisciplinary, all these associations, all these things where books are really coming from and that incredible history that what it really needs is that historical, social, cultural mindset, that understanding, that underpinning. Um, and so I'm gonna leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, as usual, a very interesting talk. And uh, again, uh, another artist I've had the pleasure of working with uh, as a curator for many years is Miriam Scher. She is a Brooklyn-based interdisciplinary artist who uses books, garments, photography, installation, and collage to explore feminine, social, and spiritual issues. She is present, represented in numerous collections, including the Alan Chazanoff Book Arts Collection at Yale Museum, the Jaffe Collection Book as Aesthetic Object at Florida Atlantic University, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, Harvard University, the Sally Bingham Center for Women's History and Culture at Duke University, and the Library of Congress. Take it away, Mimi. <laughs> Give me a second to, um, could you not share the screen? so I can get to my presentation. Hang on. Ah, there we go. Uh, slideshow, oh shoot, and show. All right, I think I have to share the screen first. There we go. Um, Sorry, I'm a little um, Zoom challenged. All right, well, thank you, uh, Mary, Karina, everyone who helped to put this together. I'm gonna start with um, some thoughts from Namita Gupta Wiggers, who, in addition to her credentials that you see below at the bottom of this page, is the founder of the Critical Craft Forum, which on, is on Facebook, actually. Um, there are more than 17,000 members. And it's one of the um, most interesting places I found for conversation about culture and making. So I'm taking her quotes and I'm inserting 
book arts over craft um, because I think it's pertinent. So let's just start with, there is no single history of the book arts. The book arts is at the core of cultural knowledge, learning between generations and community connections. Although museums and academia are considered cultural centers, these spaces do not include the breadth and depth of these book arts stories, which I think is really interesting that it sort of dovetails right on what Mary was talking about. So I wanna just stop in and give a little nod and say hello to Walter Benjamin, whose essay, Art in the Age of Photomechanical Reproduction was really influential to artists in the 20th and the 21st century um, because he talks about the how art will lose its value when it's influenced by mass production. And I've been thinking a lot about Walter Benjamin as we've been living in this virtual space where everything is mediated. And the one thing that's really struck me is that within the Zoom pandemic times, there's been a surge of online classes where people are just clamoring to make things with their hands. It's a little bit of a contradiction. So what is really interesting to me about the book arts is that artists from so many disciplines are drawn together to, to it. Painters, photographers, printmakers, poets, novelists. I come from craft and from fiber, which informs my practice. So I'm gonna share with you a brief variety of non-traditional structures and materials. Some are not even recognizable as the rectilinear codex. However, they all come together in service as containers for ideas and jumping off points for content with material as metaphor. So let's set the stage with this very early example of what might be called a book. It's a hand inscribed cuneiform seal. It's about 4,000 years old. It's only about two inches high. And like a lot of these structures, it was used to record trading details. Quipus are sometimes called talking knots, and they're also recording devices used by the Incans and other societies in South America. So they're made of colored threads with knots. Each color signifies something, each knot structure also are ways of recording and representing numbers, data, dates, values in a decimal based system. They can either be two strands or they can be 2000 strands. This flagellation book from the 15th century German, Germany is called History of the World. And I, I like to think of it as early hypertext since the book and the story can unfold in any number of pages since the strips are constantly changing and not fixed. So old technologies rarely disappear. Scrolls, for example, continue to do duty as religious texts, as in this Hebrew prayer book or Torah. The early um, Romans devised wax-coated tablets, wood tablets, called pugilares to write and erase messages with a stylus. This example is from Rome-governed Egypt in 128 AD. So again, these were used as accounting, communication. Sometimes they were folded and piled up on top of each other. And some scholars believe the word codex, which can mean block of wood in Latin, may have evolved from these wood and wax tablets. In medieval England, um, embroidery was all the rage, and that included embroidered book covers. So especially in the 16th and 17th century. On the left is the Felsberg Psalter, which is an illuminated manuscript dating to the 14th century, which is most likely the earliest known book with an embroidered binding. And the right side is the cover of a book called Miroir or Glass of the Sinful Soul, which is kind of the top 10 of embroidered book bindings in the world, which is kind of a funny thing. It was embroidered by Elizabeth, who became Queen Elizabeth I. She embroidered it for her stepmother, Catherine Parr, which is why you see little KP on the center. And it, she did it in 1544 at age 11. Shaped bindings um, have existed for centuries. So this is a distinctive fleur-de-lis shaped book from 16th century France with hand cut hand letters and hand painted images. 
the idea of heart-shaped books are also very um, common in ancient books. A lot of times it was about love of God, not romantic love. And sometimes they were song books. The one on the left is an actual 14th century binding that's been tooled. And the book on the right is actually an historic model of a heart-shaped dos a do, or two books bound together as one with a bind. They're sharing the spine in this case, but sometimes dos a dos share a backboard. And this is a really extraordinary complex structure from the 14th century and it moves in six different directions. So in the 15th century, libraries were neither free nor open to the public. So as a result, chain libraries were not uncommon. And in fact, some of them still exist. The image on the right is the chained library at Hereford Cathedral in London. And I think today the idea of chained libraries is you know, has a whole significant other meaning and is really resonant. Another structure that was of interest to me uh, was a form called the girdle book. It's where books were worn around a person's girdle or waistband so their books would be easy to consult and hard to lose. And this is a painting of a pilgrim where it shows how his girdle book is typically worn. So as I stumbled into this idea of wearable books and texts, I started to think about my own background. I grew up in a conservative Jewish family and um, I realized that there was tefillin or also called philosophies, which is from a Greek word that means to protect. They are small, tefillin are small leather boxes filled with parchment scrolls that are inscribed with Torah verses. And it's a part of a morning prayer ritual that's performed by observant Jews, traditionally in conservative and orthodox circles, men, but in more um, progressive reform, reconstructionist women do this as well. This is a 17th century wearable Quran from the collection of the Met. And in spite of growing up in a um, conservative middle-class Jewish family, my father was uh, worked for Sisters of Charity Hospital. So there were a lot of nuns in my life growing up. And there were a lot of Catholic kids who went to Catholic school and they wore scapulars, which I always found fascinating. They're little plastic, um, things that hung around their neck. And then when I did some research on this, I found that they started to appear in the seventh century and they were obviously not made of plastic at that point. Um, I'm gonna talk more now about some contemporary pieces. Lynn Allen um, is an artist based in Boston. And this is from a series that she did. Um, this is Sitting Bull Moccasins, which I was drawn to for its wearable quality, but Lynn discovered a cache of letters when she cleared out her grandmother's house after her grandmother's death that revealed that her grandmother had been a Sioux Indian that had been removed and relocated for re-education from her family. And so these are incredibly poignant. She's made a number of objects using these letters as a basis of those texts. Um, Amos Paul Kennedy, a just lovely little wearable book called African Proverbs. And this is a piece of mine, a girdle book with a heart-shaped accordion inset called Battle of My Heart, a Wall Street Valentine with a text by John Donne that I made during the last financial crisis. Um, I haven't really made anything about this current financial crisis as I haven't really been able to process it, but I think that's another slide talk. Um, other artists, there are any number of artists who are working with um, girdles and corsets as a sort of feminist female and a reference to the body. This is Tamar Stone and her piece is called To Make Her Look Her Best. She has embroidered text onto a vintage girdle as she grapples with her history of fighting with scoliosis as a child. An embroider is something I've done my whole life. So when I started to make books, whether it be on paper or onto other materials, the idea of embroidering the text really came naturally to me. These are two images from Babies Not On Board where I explored society's prejudice against women without children. And I embroidered 18 rompers and baby garments. And then I dressed 
baby dolls and mannequins with these um with these garments. And then I use that as material to make a number of books and installation and print on demand books. I also have Zhu Bing in my slide talk. Um, I have his Chairman Mao cigarettes from the tobacco project that was at the Virginia Museum of Fine Art as a way of showing an unusual um, use of text in a non-traditional or expected object. He also printed on tobacco leaves and made those leaves into books. So it's the idea of using non-paper, but a plant structure to make this book. Accordion books are really, really um, popular for obvious reasons. It's like a beautiful, simple structure. This is close to slides, what's happening with Mama, which is a house-shaped accordion book with the pages on uh, stair-like accordion pages. Deborah Shotoff, Mothers Without Stress, which is created from Xerox collage, wallboard, and dryer lint. Ted Clausen's piece, Two Letters to Him and to Her, the letters were etched onto glass, broken and placed into glass boxes. And then I want to talk a little bit about Hetty Kyle's April Diary, which was the first flag book and a really breakthrough structure and very influential to a lot of artists who've used it in their own way with their own concepts, um, including this giant flag book that was made by Anaida Hernandez for her installation, Huegos Ilegales, based on the terror of everyday life lived by illegal immigrants. Now I saw this and took this picture when this installation was at the New Museum, when the New Museum was on Lower Broadway. So what was that, the 90s? Um, it was a long time ago and a lot of things haven't changed. Um, in Family Tree, artist Zhang Wan asked for three calligraphers to write on his face for one day. This is a film still from a, one of his uh, video pieces. And when he talks about it, he said he was completely overwhelmed by his culture, by his family, by his community, by his life, to the point where he felt like he was being completely obliterated. And I was stopped in my tracks when I saw this because it was such a powerful image. Shelley Jackson's Skin, a mortal work of art, is a, tat is a novel written one word at a time, tattooed on the bodies of volunteers who could not choose the word nor the body. Um, Jackson considers this to be a living book. And last, um, one of my art heroes, Carolee Schneemann, uh, takes interior in interior scroll, takes an ancient form, transforms it in the performative space, and leaves us with the remaining artifact. So I'm going to leave you with a couple more uh, thoughts from Namita Gupta Wiggers. Um, slightly altered. How do we build the space that moves us from inviting people to have a seat at the table to rethinking the table itself? What is possible when we shift our thinking towards building a field connected to the lands beneath our feet? And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Mimi. Wonderful as usual. Um, and on to Pablo Helguera. Pablo was born in Mexico City and is a visual artist living in New York. His work involves performance, drawing, installation, theater, and other literary strategies. Recipient of international uh, uh, grants and awards, he is often considered a pioneering figure in the field of socially engaged art. He's the author of many books, including Education for Socially Engaged Art and the Parable Conference. He is currently assistant professor of arts management and entrepreneurship at the College of the Performing Arts at the New School. He writes a weekly column titled Beautiful Eccentrics. Pablo? Thank you so much, Maddie, and uh, thank you to Corina and to the Center for Book Arts for uh, inviting us to be part of this wonderful conversation. And uh, 
and and, and uh, thank you for your wonderful presentations um, that I really have enjoyed. Um, I uh, would like to talk a little bit about uh, the the subject that we are. I tend to be very literal. You know, I was invited. We were speaking about uh, the, the topic of critique in the bookmaking um, with a confession. Uh, I I. All my life, I have loved books, although my field has normally been identified as outside of bookmaking, um, social practice, and performance. However, I have always made books in my own way, uh, taking it again very literally, writing those books, and uh, and also thinking of the format of, and, the, and the act of reading as, as something particularly meaningful. Um, I was involved with the Center for Book Arts in 2007, where I did a, uh, an edition uh, titled A Dictionary of Foreign Time. It's a set of um, uh, magic lantern slides. These were like the early ways in which a slide projector would work uh, using objects uh, that belong to immigrants. These are objects found at the Tenement Museum in New York um, as a reflection on how time uh, is also a foreign entity. The uh, book has two quotes by uh, two writers, uh, L.P. Hartley, the past is a foreign country, and Paul Valéry, the future is not what it used to be. Um, so books have always uh, been an important part of my practice and my work. Um, and um, yet uh, over the years, uh, or in my early years of my career, I did not consider the book as something that I would necessarily write. My brother was a writer and I was the artist. When my brother passed away um, as an, through an accident, uh, and he was a formative figure for me, um, I instinctively ended up going back to writing. And the first project that I uh, wanted to, to develop uh, that was a book uh, was inspired on um, my observations on the art world itself as a society, as a social entity. Um, I felt that it would be um, useful to appropriate the format itself of the book to write to to refer to it. And I used um, a format that it was very common in the 19th century and it still is used somewhat today, which are etiquette manuals, manuals that tell you how to act and how to behave in society. In Latin America, the most famous uh, etiquette manual was uh, written in the uh, 19th century by a man named Manuel Antonio Carreño. It's a manual that tells you like the very basics about how you behave at the table, what, how can you be a polite person. And the rules were so specific and so regimented that, you know, it works really well in very formal settings. But when you read it today, it just feels very awkward and like really antiquated. Um, and, uh, and of course, very sexist and like and very classist, you know. But I felt that the, the unspoken rules of the art world were worth exploring um, as we ourselves, um, may, may as artists or curators or critics, uh, engage with the art world. We, there's a lot of things that we do not know. So, of course, the, the manual was um, written in that very regimented style, but it's, of course, an ironic take on the art world. And, and it did have um, aspects of it that were like... Uh, so the things that we tend to talk about, what is the ideal social choreography that an artist should follow in an opening, um, explaining that the art world is a chess game where critics are like bishops, curators are the rooks, uh, the, the artist, can, if, they, if the artist arrives to the eighth square, they, they, can, they can become a queen and so forth. Um, the book contained uh, various structures of how who's acceptable to date, and what is really the best way to put together a press release and so forth. Um, this was a period for me in which I was starting to really um, kind of uh, structure my, my understanding of the art world as, as a field that I could, I, I could actually study as, as almost in an ethnographic way. Uh, coming from Latin America, I, uh, I am very much uh, keenly aware of the way that uh, other cultures become otherized and they become exoticized and, and seen from the outside. And my, I guess my question was like, as, as artists that become, that we are ourselves outsiders, can we look at, at 
the whole con the social context under which we operate from an outside perspective. And I have always made cartoons um, uh, in my my work, but it was always in a in a very private way. I've never really show them um, publicly until social media really came about, and um, and I wanted to um, attempt a uh, some kind of appropriation of a format that is very common to the to the New Yorker magazine, uh, what's called the single panel uh, cartoons, uh, to make very specific insider comments on the uh, the VR world, uh, the things that we normally hear and say, but we don't always uh, publicly talk about, you know. Um, and um, these led to other series of books that that again are are a uh, inhabiting a format that already exists out there that is uh, very um, conventional and known by, by the mainstream however doing it with a a type of uh, insider knowledge that only you can have if you are part of this particular um, world i guess you know and um it, it's it becomes perhaps a form of therapy it becomes a form of of reflecting on our own um obsessions or fascinations and and the way in which the art market also shapes or uh, or, or or actions or influences the way that we interact you know? um i did do a, a spanish language version of the cartoons when um i was invited in, in mexico by somebody to do something similar um instead of uh, adopting the new yorker format which is very specifically related to to the american context um i still start I instead started a, a comic strip uh, called the adventures of ormeco boys uh, it's a character that i mean it, it's somehow a merging of the uh, of the format of the aztec codex but also of the peanut cartoons uh he the uh, olmeco is an artist an olmec artist who lives in the pre-columbian times he is kind of like a charlie brown character who makes these giant gigantic olmec heads which are his conceptual art and he is um he's, he's ignored and uh and laughed at by the dominant uh, artistic milieu of aztec artists and um so it became um, using the pre-Columbian world to make this this comic uh, became a way to reflect on what was the contemporary art art world in in Mexico specifically to me at least. And um, so the, the projects that I just described are just uh, specific um, reflections, and perhaps you might see them as a social critique of the art world. Uh, but I am a socially engaged artist, and my work. Uh, I believe that the role of critique in social practice is um, is to go beyond uh, the notion of critique, at least in the way it has been employed or understood by, let's say, um, an institutional critique, and instead think of it as the creation or development of a proactive and affirmative statement and proposal that can make, uh, as Bookmaster Fuller once wrote, you know, previous systems irrelevant. Uh, so as part of my great love for books, I, I did this project that was launched in 2013, uh, Libreria Donceles, of which I will talk for a few minutes. Um, in Mexico City, there's a, um, those of you who, who might be familiar with Mexico City, and if you go downtown, it's an incredible historical um, part of the city. Uh, every street kind of has its own uh, business uh, theme or focus. Uh, if you want to buy wedding dresses, you go to a particular street. If you want to buy uh, office supplies, you go to another street. If you want to buy electronics, etc. And if there's a book, uh, sorry, there's a, uh, a street called Donceles, uh, which is behind the cathedral that is all used bookstores and is to me a fantastic you know, paradise type of place. And if you like books, uh, which I'm sure all of you do, uh, this is really a wonderful adventure, you know, and going into a used bookstore is very different, of course, than going to a, a contemporary kind of commercial bookstore. It's really not about looking for something in particular, it's really about immersing yourself in this forest of books, and then hopefully finding something interesting for 10 pesos or so, which is very little. Um, I developed this project during a time when uh, I was uh, saddened by the quick closure of many uh, used bookstores. 
and in particular for by the closure of the last bookstore in uh, in Manhattan that that sold books in Spanish. Uh, I uh, did a little research on that on the history of of uh, books in bookstores in in New York, and uh, the subject of immigration. And um, um, I I uh, well, first of all, it, it's important to to note that that uh, it's striking that in. Uh, New York City, uh, which has around 2 million Latino um, uh, inhabitants, that has uh, basically no Spanish language bookstores, or uh, at least uh, exclusively dedicated to selling books in Spanish. In the, in the 1920s, uh, a poet, Jose Juan Tablada, a Mexican poet who was also a diplomat working uh, in the embassy in Mexico, I mean, in New York, he uh, decided to open a bookstore of his own. It was called Libreria de los Latinos. It was a project that uh, was uh, kind of a uh, um, kind of a, a very ambitious and uh, an almost artistic project, which did not last. He only lasted a few months because he was a great poet and uh, but not great businessman. Um, and I wanted to go back to that um, idea of like, what if we created a, a, a a used language, a used Spanish language bookstore for local communities. I went back to Mexico uh, and I started a campaign uh, um, compiling uh, donations of books, uh, offering artwork in return for different donations. And um, one thing that, that is, I think, really interesting in Mexico City, as in many other places, um, uh, Mexico uh, is full of uh, uh, families and, and, and people that, especially middle class, um, they just accumulate things in their house because you, re you rarely, if ever, move. Or it's, it's moving is not so common, so you accumulate stuff. And uh, people wanted to contribute to the project, helping the uh, immigrant, um, especially immigrant, Spanish-speaking immigrants in, in, um, in the U.S. Uh, by just giving away their books. And people from all walks of life participated. People were from... Um, uh, office workers to teachers to even children giving on their own ch children's books um, toward the project. Uh, before we knew it, uh, we had 20,000 volumes. And uh, this was also the, the early years of the Kickstarter campaigns, which uh, to me were really, really helpful as we were able to fundraise enough to bring the 20,000 um, volumes to, uh, to New York. And Libreria Don Celes was opened in a, at a gallery in Chelsea, um, and um, and it was it, putting it together was was a, a very special experience for me. I am I always say I'm, I'm the last analog generation, the person who grew up without internet, uh, and uh, books were to me my internet. They were the they were the universe of of knowledge, the way in which I connected with the world, and um, the reconstructing the reconstruction of the or construction of the of the project was in a way kind of a reconstruction of my family home when when i was a kid in mexico and uh it, be, it was a very capricious kind of create creating this very home-like environment where where people could just hang out and like and and relax with the books um it became in a way a project that uh you will call in in uh, sociology a third place a place that is not work that is not home but it's a place where people uh joint interest the joint interest can come together to to to, uh, to share their work and uh, their love for books the bookstore traveled uh through the different cities it continues to travel today um this was in phoenix arizona uh it has traveled to around 14 different cities uh and it has uh, met very different purposes in the different places where it has gone i mean it has it has served as this open uh space where uh, immigrant rights groups or women's rights groups or or like uh, people just interested in in sensitizing others to uh, to other cultures uh, can come together and uh, have discussions and events this is in san francisco um, and i just want to mention that that uh, the, the way the bookstore operates is uh, books are pay what you wish you pay anything you want but you have to pay something and you can only take one book with you and all the proceeds go to local organizations that uh, that support uh, either the promotion of of uh, Spanish language uh, or Latin American uh, um, culture, or or serve other uh, related social causes like immigration and stuff, immigration rights. Um, but to me, it was really important to first to be really a bookstore that that really. 
uh, uh, allowed an individual to come uh, and and take a book with them. So it's not a library; it's a book. So you, that, to me, the ownership of the of the object is important, uh, and uh, the the ability to make that selection yourself, and the connection between the the, the book donor and the, and the book buyer is important. Um, this is in a Red Hook where I live in my neighborhood. After um, the Hurricane Sandy, it felt very important to me to uh, to be able to do something to uh, renovate the, the cultural life of the, the neighborhood that was severely uh, affected by, by the storm. And, uh, and there we created, again, or uh, what, uh, what I call the tertulias, which are like these uh, soirees that happen weekly, where we can have book readings, performances, and other types of uh, interactive events uh, that can sometimes be, be done in collaborations with uh, with uh, colleges or university groups or with individuals who want to share their work. And in essence, that is to me the, 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 the relevance of a place like Libreria Donceles. It's essentially a social place uh, that where um, the, the textural and the, the sensorial aspect of the book is, is really important. Just to conclude, I know this has been long, um, I just want to mention that to me, um, the my relationship with the book is, is as again, as I said, is very deep and, uh, and it's also very personal. And um, I just want to mention one practice that I have had for many, many years now. Um, it's titled the Arlington Heights Suite. Uh, it, it's a daily practice. It's almost like a diaristic practice where I use discarded educational books. Um, I am uh, by, by uh, formation uh, a, uh, an educator and uh, I'm interested in the subject of explanations and, uh, and captions. So I've been making uh, every night uh, these uh, collages uh, using illustrations and texts that I find that try to best describe uh, whatever happened that day. Um, the practice has now evolved into uh, around uh, 12,364 collages uh, that are just part of this large collection. And uh, the, the, the project is to be able to finally exhibit them together um in one single location whenever the time comes but uh in in other words it's 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 a way um in some way it's a score of scores it's, pr it's producing a uh a, a series of, of of a narrative or a pattern that can be used performatively and in a way it's also a very uh, extensive book that in my particular situation it, it it's it's uh perhaps an autobiographical uh, uh, book, but at the same time, it's it's detached. It's not. It's it's uh, it's appropriated from with images existing from other places. It's it's a book of books, and um, and again, it's another example, of, at least for me, in which the book always figures in, in a in a way in which allows one to to uh, think critically uh, of yourself, of your of the world around you, and uh, and hopefully offer some answers. That's it. Thanks, Pablo. Sorry, we're in a bit of a rush, so I'm going to get straight to John. Uh, John Haber is an arts writer and textbook editor in New York with a background in hard science. That mix makes an interesting interest in artist books only natural. He began HaberArts.com 25 years ago, and it has grown to thousands of reviews from blog posts to in-depth articles and from art history to contemporary art. He tries to place a critic's, a critic's judgment within a context of description and interpretation to make art of all kinds more accessible, provocative, and interesting. Take it away, John. John, um, I think we need to have you uh, unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Oh, well, thanks. Well, again, thanks, Maddie. Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, I'll uh, 
be abridging my talk a bit because we're running late. So I apologize if, uh, you know, if I'm making this up on the fly and let you down. Now, I meant this opening image really is just a, a placeholder while I got going, but it was too beautiful to pass up. It's by Jean Poyet from uh, the Book of Hours of Henry VIII around 1500. And, but while I'm here, I'll let me throw out a question already. Um, just how important can an artist book like this be to uh, the story of the Renaissance? And by extension, how much, how important can it be to art today? And it's not obvious if you pick up a textbook in the Northern Renaissance, you probably won't find this. Uh, artists certainly didn't flock to it the way Italian artists uh, across the country to flock to uh, The Last Supper in Milan, and they couldn't have. This was between the pages of a book in France. It, um, but still it has uh, you know something so special. It's at the very peak of the high Renaissance. It's um, both unusually naturalistic, but also conversely, something of a fantasy, it's an ideal summer. So I think we can already see that uh, an artist's book in its intimacy adds something to how we see history in ourselves. And I'll try to come back to this. Meanwhile, um, Maddie's already introduced who I am and, um, and it should make me a natural for the artist's book, um, growing up bookish and working with textbooks as well as with writing about art. And, um, and also my background in science, I had to be intrigued when the central booking said it was opening a space just for uh, book artists that applied to the intersection of art and science. And um, that space is gone for now, but um, I still love this last month stumbling on um, this artist, Melvin Way, an outsider artist at a gallery that specializes in outsider art, Andrew Edlin. And he was, um, made a habit of uh, taking his own handwritten, not altogether plausible math and chemical formulas and creating a scrapbook or journal out of them, a very strange kind of uh, book art. And it can be at any moment at once um, mesmerizing or just plain laugh out loud. But there's another reason I think that a critic should take an interest in uh, artist book because um, if, we find artists who combine object, text, and image in a lot of ways. That's what uh, critics are for too. Now, if you ask most people what um, makes for a good critic, you'd probably hear good taste. And um, you also might hear that words stand in the way of a work of, of, of art, you know, the way that icky theory does. And I'd like to argue that both of those are wrong. As far as I'm concerned, you're free to think that I have god awful taste. I'm not here to pick winners for you, to plan your weekend. Rather, the historians and critics I've loved most are the ones who opened my eyes to whole new experiences. And um, that's what I'd love uh, critics to do too. Um, and when you think about it again, about the intersection of writing and art, that's what artists do so much too. You, we go to art to have our experiences expanded of other ideas, other people, other countries, and other places. It's partly a matter of diversity of focus today, but it's really what art can do all along. Um, so all that said, though, I was rather late in coming to an admiration for book art. Um, for one thing, I wanted to keep my interests separate because I thought they deserved no less. Um, Art and books and science too all have their own sense of wonder and their own sense of rigor. They're not just metaphors for one another. You know, if I hear one more time that relativity is about everything's relative, I'm, I'm gonna just totally lose it. But um, another reason is that as we saw in the opening slide, book art is so often just plain under the radar. Even if you went to the uh, art on paper book fair, looking for book art, you really wouldn't find it, uh, this, this hideous slide notwithstanding, which comes from the Ferris homepage. Um, you know, mostly you'd get prints and posters. And there's an assumption underlying that too, which is, I think for most of us, art primarily takes place in a public arena. We flock to galleries and museums and in summer's parks for, uh, for art. We um, if we're looking for the origins of the Renaissance, uh, we go to churches and chapels throughout Europe, uh, looking for it there. Maddie already showed this, which is an image uh, 
by uh, Giotto, his frescoes for the Arena Chapel in Padua. And, um, and many of the uh, works that I admire and love most are, take place on a public scale too, like abstract expressionism. So um, what turned me around, I think, was um, having to not just encounter an artist's book, but then having to ask what in the world an artist's book is. And the wonder is that there was really so many examples and also so many different answers. We already saw some of those answers uh, just today. For one thing, an artist book is indeed an art object. Um, that's in the title of the panel right now. But for another thing, an artist book is what's inside the object, which can be text, images, you name it. And it can also be the very process of publishing a book, which is the topic for uh, another panel later this weekend. And you can see all of those in uh, another show of Renaissance France um, right now at the Morgan Library. It's in that tiny room off the uh, Morgan's lobby where you usually rush past on the way to something else. But uh, in this case, please don't. It's about a patron of the arts, Claude de Lobespin, and um, he commissioned artist books like like this one with, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful co co covered um, the artisanship here is um, known not by the person's name. All we know is that it was the uh, Mahu Asip uh, workshop. And that's because uh, they also turned out a version of Asip's fables. But besides the object, if you open that book cover as Claude could have, you might've seen um, texts in, in this particular case, it was uh, the work of a land surveyor and in another case, it was uh, Pierre Ronsard, uh, France's uh, greatest poet at the time. And you'd see some of the greatest uh, illustrators of his time too. And as far as the process, book art is a process of publishing, of course, Claude was building the library. Um, and Miriam has uh, already examined what the connotations of a library meant at the time. And um, there's naturally, uh, I think you can see some of that same multiplicity in, um, in art now, as again, we've seen pretty much this morning and I'm gonna try to take examples as much as I can from, uh, from central booking. And again, sorry if I'm rushing through everything way too quickly to, uh, to contribute enough. Um, on the one hand, again, uh, book art can be about uh, imagery. And uh, here, uh, Mary Frank, uh, has created somehow her own personal fossil record. Um, Mary is uh, an older woman artist, one of many now who thankfully are, are getting her recognition and her due. And as for the uh, book artist object, well, um, here to, um, to one side, um, Michelle Wilson has cut through the pages of a book to create the topography of an endangered landscape in Brazil. And to the other side, um, Jordan Andrzejk has taken up an old art book form that we've again already seen today, the accordion book, but she's given it a sense of an object by the transparency of her colors and also linked it to uh, information science because this is about, um, uh, as she calls it, shades of white. And maybe even more fascinating are uh, artist books that are harder to pin down that fall well, into all or none of these categories. Here's uh, someone named Paul Tecklenburg. Um, this image looks like an electron micrograph, although the it's on a human scale and the objects turned out not to be very uh, small at all. And I'm not even gonna tell you how he made it. And, but just leave open the question of, is it, um, is it an image? Is it an object? Is it, what is it? And, and the wonderful thing is that I can leave you to find your own answers to that. So to uh, come back to uh, just the first slide, again, the, uh, this can really, uh, an acquaintance with book art like this can alter your history and your sense of history. And it has for me, now that I've spent more time with artist book, when I reviewed and show of illuminated manuscripts at the, uh, more at the Morgan Library, I began with these words. What if the Renaissance took place in secret? What if centuries of art began in miniature? 
So, um, of course, there are other private experiences of art too. Artists make sketches just for themselves and their friends. They make sketches as preparatory uh, to paintings and sculpture. But um, an artist book even there differs a bit because um, it's, um, it's something that's open to anyone and maybe just one person at a time. So if you're that one person, I hope that uh, book art can, uh, opening a book can, uh, can open your eyes. And I'll leave that with you. And I'll just, again, plug myself that uh, my website's now grown to a kind of miniature uh, encyclopedia or resource in contemporary art and art history, HaberArts.com. And I welcome you to take a look at it. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, John. That was really wonderful. Um, Maddie, did you have any uh, closing remarks that you wanted to add? Um, well, I'm still seeing. <laughs> John, can you un un uh, share your screen, please? <laughs> okay. Hmm. Anyway, all right. There we. Um, well, and, um, I had hoped that we would have a little more time for discussion, but uh, uh, it was important to get in everybody's presentations as well. So um, um, just thank you everybody for being here. I guess we can continue discussion at a later time. Uh, anybody is quite welcome to email us. We all work together and know each other, we can, we're very glad to answer any of your questions and discuss anything that in our brief presentations were just popped up as um, we covered, I know we covered a lot of ground, we had very little time to do it, but as I say, it's, it's a very big, rich topic. And um, uh, especially when we're, we're talking in terms of, of creating a, a whole lexicon for dealing with the work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maddie. Um, and I just wanted to say that we should all continue this conversation in the chat on the uh, Printed Matter Virtual Art Book Fair page for CABC. Um, I'll be posting that link in the Zoom chat momentarily. Um, but so fascinating to hear from everyone. And thank you so much, Maddie, for organizing this program.